Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. In 2010, today's guest published what is arguably the most important book of the 21st century. She is a former professor of engineering mechanics with degrees in civil engineering, structural engineering, applied physics and materials engineering science. Her book, entitled Where Did the Towers Go?, provides the only comprehensive scientific investigation into the events of 9-11 in the public domain. The conclusions are staggering, which are that two of the world's tallest, strongest buildings and most of their contents were literally turned to dust by an advanced, covert energy weapon. Not by planes, not by bombs and not by nukes, but by a non-kinetic energy weapon. Welcome Judy Wood. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Or should I say Dr. Judy Wood. Now, um, we'll just start, Judy. You, you, you've come to the UK quite recently and you've been on a, on a lecture tour. Can you just give us a, a brief outline of that? Of where I've been? W where you've been and how it's been received. It's been received very well and I feel lucky to be among such wonderful people who appreciate understanding and who who uh, really want to know about what's going on rather than uh, you know be, well being alive and thinking rather than just going along with whatever flow and just being led whatever down whatever path this is what actually happened what you see tonight is what actually happened it's not a theory this is slow motion and there are various pieces falling but notice they're trailing dust and there's a piece that will emerge right in here and watch how it trails dust and then it runs out of dust because it, it's gone. This piece right here. So, so what kind of subjects did you lecture in then? I lectured in mechanics of materials. Mechanics of materials, okay. Does it strike you through the powder? Yeah, I mean, that's right. I've uh, been to Penzance, yeah. Brighton, uh, the outskirts of Brighton and then Gravesend and then near Manchester and then um, uh, Northampton and then uh, tomorrow we go to Aberdeen Aberdeen thank you Aberdeen and then Edinburgh and then um, Glasgow and then down to Cardiff okay and um, viewers can watch the two previous interviews that uh, I did with Judy Wood uh, because there's quite a lot of um, detail in, in those interviews. Prior to the tour that you're doing now, uh, you spoke at an energy conference, a, a free energy conference, was that? It, it was about new energy. They call it breakthrough energy, the breakthrough energy movement, because I think free energy has gotten a bad name and it has bad connotations with it. But it was a wonderful conference put on uh, over three days it, just outside of... Um, uh, Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Yeah, in Helverson, I think the name of the town. It was terrific people, and it was interesting. The last night, it's like nobody wanted to leave and say goodbye, and we're up till 3 a.m. talking. So a lot of the speakers there are putting forward the case that there are certain technologies which have possibly been suppressed, which would solve the world's energy crisis and get us off fossil fuels. That's what the aim is. Okay, and and. Were there, were there any extremely convincing uh, technologies discussed at that uh, conference? I wasn't so much looking at that. Um, I'm looking at more of the direction I'm coming from, which is a demonstration of free energy technology rather than it's right around the corner, it's right around the corner. We hear that so much. And sometimes it's for real and sometimes it's a distraction. Um, but what I found there is people were very receptive to what I was showing. They had originally poo-pooed it and were convinced that I was talking nonsense because they'd heard that from others. But I had a wonderful reception. People sort of turned 180 degrees. Because what you're saying is that somebody already has this technology yes. and they've used it and in the form of... And demonstrated to us. Yeah, demonstrated to us in the form of a weapon. Yes. Which, which we will come on to. So you describe it as a non-kinetic weapon. Can you just, just for viewers describe the difference between kinetic and non-kinetic? Well kinetic being like heat, um, nuke bombs are, have a whole tremendous amount of heat or uh, regular bombs, you know, chunks go flying, break things into parts. Missiles, 
something moves and hits something else, wrecking balls, something pounding on something or heating something up. But there are other types of weapons that don't heat something but affect it. They, what I mean by directed energy, the energy is, in the most general sense, it's directed geographically only to affect this particular place and not across the street. But also, the energy is directed as in giving it instructions what to do differently than engine or energy normally does. All right, so it's not just directed in terms of its position, it's directed in terms of its instructions, that's what yes, you're saying. Yes, yes. Because the, the equation that I remember from physics of a kinetic energy weapon would be uh, the energy in a cricket ball, if you throw a cricket ball, that's a kinetic energy weapon, is a half mv squared, which is a half times the mass of the cricket ball times its velocity squared gives you the amount of energy in that energy weapon, because a cricket ball is an energy weapon, really. We're sending somebody in, in uh, croquet, you know, you get two balls, you put your foot on one, you whack this one, that one takes yeah. off. So this is non-kinetic, it's, so it's... Wh right. Right. Now, is, does that mean it's electromagnetic, or can you, t can you explain what it actually is? It's various things. What I call it is magnetic electrogravitic nuclear reactions. It involves magnetism, electricity, gravity, and it causes nuclear reactions. Right. And, and w one analogy that people can think of is their microwave oven as being a, an example of directed energy. Yeah. Or lasers. Or lasers. Those are line of sight. Or... Um, uh, I guess microwave sometimes is in a region, but this is a combination of different types of energy that create different effects and interact. Right. Now let's just summarize the reason why you you state that the that the towers uh, didn't hit the ground. They well, they didn't. They didn't burn up, nor did they slam to the ground, but turn into dust in midair. And we know that because if they slammed to the ground, we'd have a pile of rubble left over. If they slammed to the ground, the seismic signal would have shown that, which it didn't. And if they slammed to the ground, um, they're actually built in the Hudson River, 70 feet below the water table on bedrock. And so there's this dike around them. You get two half million ton buildings and another quarter million ton building and slam it down, you're going to bust the, the water retaining wall. And there's a whole lot of other evidence concerning um, things that were made of metal that were isolated from the ground, such as cars uh, that had all of these bizarre effects that you wouldn't have expected if two buildings had yeah. collapsed through a conventional right. mean. The effects were material specific. Mm. All right. Mm. Now, um, n normally you would focus strictly on the physical evidence, and you, you have done so far in your book and in your lectures. But this time in this tour, you, you, you're speaking more about the cover-up of this information and how that cover-up has been orchestrated and, and the psychi psychology behind it. Can you just explain that for us, Judy? Yes, the, the buildings turn to dust in midair. If you look at it, you can see that. Why do so many people not see it? Why was nearly the entire world fooled that day? And in order for people to see what happened, they have to figure out how to get around this. And I found there's three things that keep them from seeing it. Number one, problem solving skills. Number two, groupthink or peer pressure. And number three, they're terrified by the implications. But of the, the problem solving skills, I've said this before about the importance of first determining what happened before you can determine how it happened. You have to determine what it is. And that before you can determine who did it or why they did it and so forth. And what I've discovered is one of the easiest ways to run a cover-up and to keep the cover-up safe is to get folks to focus on how it happened. Because if you start out with how it happened before you've determined what it is, you're assuming what it is. So you're solving an imagined problem, not a real problem. You haven't defined the problem. When I in, teach in statics class, first thing you have to teach students is to make the problem statement. Here's the problem statement. Here's what you're looking for. Here's the information given. Draw a line. What you're going to look for. Draw a line. Go about solving it. And you have to define that problem before you can solve it. Once you define it, it gets a lot easier to solve. Right. And few people do that. So, so if you get people to focus on how it was done, they go round and round arguing about opinions of whatever, and they never will solve it. And it will create contention within that as well. I've actually, in, in my talks, call it a, a phony bone of contention, which is contention around something which 
has a flawed assumption right. within it. Right, and it goes round, 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 round. Okay. All right. Um, and, and I know that Andrew Johnson has spoken at length and written a book about the 9-11 the cover-up. Yep. And another thing that, that uh, I often talk about, you know, if they, you don't like the do lie behind door number one, they'll show you lie behind door number two. If you don't like that one, lie behind door number three. Whatever to keep you from looking at the open field behind you. And you talk about the psychology of denial because the implications are just too grotesque for people to, to face and I'm actually experiencing that with some British members of Parliament that, that I've been writing to uh, about another thing which is the 7-7 seven seven London bombings and I would describe them as being in well some kind of psychotic state which is it's denial they're not they're not they're, they're not even looking at the evidence. Do you remember in first grade um, there was usually, at least when I was in first grade, that's what it was going on about Santa Claus, the Santa Claus myth, and some kid would tell uh, others that Santa Claus doesn't exist, and they'd all get mad at him. No, no, it does exist. And some kids would be crying if they learned about that. I guess kids are actually learning earlier now because they're exposed to that. But the anger in that, it, it's just like the end of the world. To learn that what they know doesn't exist, or to learn that their parents lied to them, and in this con job and actually think it might be a good thing to help them get used to the idea that they can be conned. Now f for those who actually question whether or not the towers did in fact turn to dust in midair, there's a clip which I don't think I've shown uh, on Rich Planet before of, if you just describe this, this clip Judy, I don't think I've seen this one. If you look at the, if this is the northwest corner of the North Tower, you see that vertical line near the center of the image and you'll notice in a little bit, there will be a, a whitish beam that you'll see dropping down. And it'll emerge, and as it emerges, you see this opaque trail of dust behind it. And it becomes clearer and clearer, it's trailing dust, and pretty soon it runs out of dust to trail because it no longer exists. It becomes dust. And then when you look at it at full speed, you not only realize this beam is doing that, but everything in the image is doing that. And if you look down at the intersection right after where that stuff was falling, it's not there. It's just paper. Now this process um, which we're seeing in that image, you have linked it to something which is akin to or similar to cold fusion. And in a cold f it has a lot of similarities with, with what was called cold fusion, low energy nuclear reaction. A low energy nuclear reaction. And uh, this was something which was covered up in the late 1980s, early yeah, 1990s. 1989. Right, and so it's, so it's a technology which, which you think w was taken over by the military, presumably. Um, yeah, I never know when, you know, officials have it. Uh, if it pops out I in the public domain, maybe they may try to shut it down. I, th I have a feeling that, you know, top secret places, wherever, black technology, it's there already. But in 1989, this popped out. It's the work of Pons and Fleischmann. Yeah. But the uh, significant thing that was discovered then was this type of reaction. It was through electrolysis, uh, an electrolytic process. And they found transmutation, different metals forming on the electrodes that, you know, they don't know where it came from. It, it, it uh, indicated there was a, a nuclear process going on as well as the tritium that was measured. And tritium, up until that point, had only been found in like nuke bombs, where you get other types of ionizing radiation, the kind of thing where Geiger counters are going to go off that you would, you would find. And they were first saying that Pons and Fleischmann were bogus because, because of this, this uh, you know, only tritium and not the other. And John Bacris actually was the first to discover this tritium, and they, somebody wrote this nasty um, article I think in Science Magazine saying he must have spiked his sample with tritium because why else is this other stuff in there and Pons and Fleischmann would be dead if there re this really was. It, so there's a lot of data on that and it's been sorted out. We can put this graph on the screen which is uh, what was measured at the World Trade Center site after, after, the, after the events. Just explain the graph for us Judy. On the right hand side you'll see a logarithmic scale and I've given samples of different things that have been measured. Over on the left-hand side, at the bottom, you'll see it starts at 1963, 
to about 1990, and it's showing the decrease in the tritium levels in the Great Lakes. And that tritium was there because of atmospheric nuclear bomb testing. And you can see it, it decreases, and it has a, a half-life of about 12 and a half years. The next one over is current measurements in the Great Lakes. And then the yellow one in the middle is the actual measurements that were taken shortly after 9-11, where there's these very high levels of tritium that are not just random high, um, high normal. There's definitely a source of something that put tritium there. So, so the appearance of this thing called tritium, which is a... Uh, Indicates, uh, is no doubt, there was some sort of nuclear reaction going on. Right. It, it actually absolutely confirmed. Now, there also was no uh, ionizing radiation recorded. Nobody with Geiger counters came around and found anything. And if you remember Chernobyl, I've got a diagram in the book and with a question asking, uh, do you think they could have kept Chernobyl a secret? because it shows the measurements all around the planet of the fallout from that. And there was no m such measurements on 9-11. Yeah, because this is one of the three alternative theories that people put forward, is that, is that it was done by some kind of nuclear weapon. Somebody around the planet would have been measuring it. Right, so there would have been fallout measured around the site of 9-11, and there was no fallout radiation. But there was the presence of tritium. Yes. So the, 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 the process of cold fusion is something which creates tritium mm -hmm. uh, in those sort of quantities. So you think it's something similar? That, yeah, and, the, and the, the third one, I mean the fourth value over is values that you measure in LENR, low energy nuclear rea reactions, or cold fusion. And the far end of the scale is what is, comes from, you know, the source is uh, leaky nuclear plants which is sky high, it's like 18,000 times what was measured at the World Trade Center. So the closest, if you look at the order of magnitude measured, was low energy nuclear reactions of all those choices of the sources. And if you have fire hoses on it and so forth, you're going to get it pretty watered down. Rich Planet TV is coming to a town near you. In May 2013, I will be travelling around the UK, speaking at the following places. Gateshead, Glasgow, Leeds, Liverpool, Birmingham, Western Super, Southampton, Reading and London. I'll be covering recent UFO reports which is not to be missed, and exposing a range of issues you won't find discussed on mainstream TV. Welcome back. I'm talking to Dr. Judy Wood about 9-11. Uh, now then, Judy, um, some people have put forward the idea that this thing called HARP might have been used to create this effect. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, it seems like another kind of name dropping like Bin Laden, it's just a different boogeyman. And you, if you can turn a building into powder in midair, it's got to be done with a classified technology. That technology is not going to be in the public domain. And if it's not in the public domain, we're not going to know the name of whatever technology that did this. That's why I don't bother to look at, you know, any meeny mighty mo of the choices that are out there. Instead, you know, this name dropping of HARP has done so much that I've come to say that HAARP, what that stands for is High Amplitude Advancement of Real Propaganda. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, the other thing that people allege HARP is used for is weather modification. And if you was just want to go and watch the previous interviews uh, that I did with Dr. Wood, uh, if, you, if you go to the website richplanet.net and on the left hand side you click on 9-11 shows, those two interviews are in there. And this, in, in the second interview, we spoke about the hurricane. Was it a hurricane? Yeah, yeah. Hurricane Erin. Uh, hurricane Erin on 9-11, which had a very peculiar path, and which was a, a perfect straight line. It's, it, it parks up outside New York, 500 miles off the coast, during the events of 9-11, and then changes direction. And you've suggested that the, the, the electrostatic field associated with that sort of... Well, we know that it... it I go with what I know. Um, that, you know, the hurricane, it's weird that it's there. The National Weather Service, you know, in their text messaging, uh, they thought it was going to turn around day one. It didn't. They thought it was going to turn around day two. It didn't. They th thought it was going to turn around on day three. It didn't. They thought it was going to turn around day four, and thank goodness it did because it was right outside the door of, of New York City. But why didn't people know about it ahead of time? But it was there, and there's no question it was there. Now, hurricanes produce static fields. Yeah. 
electrostatic field, oh, the thing that makes your hair <coughs> stand up on end when you rub it with a balloon. And people sometimes feel a storm coming. They feel that static field. Yes. Birds know when to hide. Now this is a good time to play this clip of these trucks that you showed me earlier, Judy, which is fascinating. Uh, just put that on the screen now. Now we can see, just to, just to explain what's going on in this clip. This is from a tornado earlier this year in, uh, I think it was April, April 3rd, 2012. Which also has a static field surrounding yes, it. Yes, it's it's, this is in Dallas, Texas area. There's a, a bunch of tornadoes that were there. But these trucks are definitely being levitated. And notice there's no other you know, pieces of uh, material. You, you don't have dumpsters flying up. So we would call them articulated lorries in this country. Okay, yeah. okay. So, they, so, they're, so they're flying about in the sky. You, right. Yeah. It, and, they're and, and you'd say that is not uh, the wind or, or, or the, or right. the gusts doing that. If it was, how, if how it was wind, there would be other things right. flying around yeah. too. Yeah. So how are those trucks being levitated as best you can explain that? there is a type of, of field effects surrounding um, tornadoes and hurricanes that cause levitation. And those same kind of fields, well, we have this Hurricane Aaron right outside of Manhattan, and we do have evidence that there was static field there because there is thunder reported at JFK Airport, LaGuardia Airport, and Newark Airport, the three major airports surrounding Manhattan on 9-11 reported thunder. So we have proof that the hurricane was indeed close enough. And various weather events, you see this similar type of effects, and this is in nature. Whether or not uh, you know, something set off the, the hurricane that is, or tornado that's unnatural, it's still it's produced by those things. And, and I do advise people to go and watch that, in, that second interview because uh, um, it, it does seem that, it's, that there's been some uh, orchestration behind that hurricane. So, I mean, what, what can you, so, so you would say that the hurricane provided one component of the weapon? Um, I, I can't say that, that I know that because I'm not in the control room. I don't, you know, I'm not, I didn't, you know, do the event. But you can say that, you know, weather stations normally love hurricanes. They milk them for all they can get. And, oh, we got this hurricane coming. So tune into our station. They're, you've seen ones like this Sandy thing. Let's just go back to HARP then because this is another thing that people have alleged that they think HARP is being used to manipulate the weather and possibly steer uh, hurricanes and one person who I heard recently talking about this was Stan Dale and he said that he had checked because apparently you can go on the internet and check where HARP is being focused around the world or around the United States and he's correlating that with the position of the hurricane and what do you, what's your opinion on that? I don't know anything about that. There, he has collected some some nice uh, data at times. I've, I've, it was many years ago, where he showed this grid work of uh, earthquakes that was happening somewhere, and that was fascinating. I think evidence shows us the best rather than going to any kind of names, um, because because we're making assumptions then. The, 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 other, the other point that he made, Judy, uh, not specifically about HARP, was that let's just say um, there is some manipulation going on by some party. He said that uh, Russia and China have also got the same capability and he said that they would either have to be, they would have to allow it because their technology could be used to override, let's say, whoever's doing this. What are your thoughts on that? Is well, this is getting a little bit, you know, a, a side of, of things, but it, that requires making assumptions that each country is a separate entity, and I'm not sure of that. Right. Kind of like uh, states and so forth, we're led to believe that, that, for example, the different presidential candidates, you have this one versus this one, the, and you look back and forth, back and forth, so you don't look elsewhere. There, I don't know who's controlling this and who are the, is in control, who the crew is that are, that's controlling anything. And when we start making assumptions, we're fixing to mess up. Now, um, I just want to talk about uh, Jesse Ventura. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, Jesse Ventura uh, is the governor of uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. And he has a fairly popular TV show in the States called Conspiracy Theory. Yeah. Uh, 
he's covered many different conspiracy theories on his show, and uh, a lot of people like it very much. And he has exposed some uh, a lot of uh, information. Now, uh, you uh, took part in one of his shows. This was when did that happen? You when did you actually um, when we were interviewed? Filled me in early September a year ago. You, you at one point you thought that they pulled the interview. Is that what right. they pulled that particular show that you appeared in? Right. It was supposed to air, I think, the beginning of January. And then, well, it's going to be the end of January. 2012. Yep. And then it's going to be the beginning of February, and then it's going to be the end of February. Well, the beginning of March, and about that time I started wondering about what was going on. And last, um, let's see, July, I heard Jesse Ventura on a, a radio show saying, he thought it was less than a 50% chance this, this series would ever see the light of day. The whole series or just the that one series. show? The whole series. And the whole series got pulled last year. It was going round and round in edit mode. They kept, they, that's what they were telling me, that they need to keep editing it. And then something happened right after that. And it ended up in someone else's hands and they needed to re-edit it to how they wanted it. And then voila, it came out. Right. And it, so it was, you think it was re-edited from what it was originally intended to be then? Right, because a different, uh, as it was explained, a different group was yeah. um, in, in charge. And everyone has their own style for how they want it edited. So, uh, it seems like they were maybe going to pull it and then they've just messed with it instead, you think? Yeah, you, right, right. They edited it in how they wanted it. And there, what I was told that um, there were originally eight episodes to the series and they were going to air seven of them. All right, now, um, and in that sh episode that you were in, uh, he, he described the technology as a death ray, all right? Uh, and he, he, he they went through the fact that Nikola Tesla had had some of his research stolen off him in the 1940s and that they'd continued some of his research and that possibly uh, this death ray, as they describe it, had been continued to be developed by the Reagan administration using the Star Wars Defense, Defense Initiative money, which, if you think about it, what Star Wars was alleged to be, it was to knock uh, missiles out of, the, out of the air and create this sort of invisible defensive shield. So that's, that sounds plausible to me, that the, a death ray may have been developed. What, what are your thoughts on the use of that word and the, and the general way that it was presented on conspiracy? Well, the word is, is unfortunate. But if you remember in 2006, when I first started really showing a lot of the evidence, folks were saying, well, energy weapons don't exist. And I said, well, what do you think our tax dollars went to in the Star Wars program? So the first big series I put out there, the name of it was uh, the Star Wars Beam Weapons, to sort of hit people in the head of, you know, those people probably know what was used. If this is an energy weapon, certainly you know, somebody running the Star Wars program would know what kind of thing it was. I didn't know the name of it, but that's how I started out. And the, this death ray business, that is rather unfortunate, but when I saw that that's what they're going to be calling the episode, I figured maybe that's the only way they could get this out. Right. Under the wire. Because Jesse Ventura himself, uh, I think is... Um trying to get the truth out, but perhaps he's not in total control of, of the edit and, and, and the show. One thing I can say is, is every time I've heard him on a radio show talking about my work, he's never made a mistake. Jesse Ventura was on the Alex Jones show recently. For those who don't know, Alex Jones is a, has a radio show in America, which is, again, it covers conspiracy theories, if that's what you want to call them. Uh, and Jones was seen to uh, accept what Jesse Ventura was saying about what he called the death ray, but really he was talking about an energy weapon, which that's not what my understanding of Alex Jones has been. In my, from what I've learned about Alex Jones, he's always knocked back people who wanted to talk about your research. So, and, do, and, so do you think there's been a shift w it, to, to just at least discuss it? I, don't, I don't know, and there was um, the next person on on his program was um, Jesse's son, and that was another thing altogether. And it was it turned into uh, people who supported Dr. Wood are attacking him, and the other side's attacking these sides, are attacking that side. And it was it seemed very divisive. Yeah, I, I think perhaps what's going on is that when they're trying to hide something, the, the first 
Look thing over here. <laughs> yeah, but they, they, they initially ignore it and make sure it doesn't get in the media. But when it gets to a certain level, they can't ignore it, so they then Mutated. color it. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps there's a bit of that going on. Who, who and knows? If, I w if I were going to rationalize you know, and, and uh, excuse you know, how things are coming out, um, maybe the public can't handle, um, you know, understand exactly what happened with, you know, interference of different energy forms. And so having it called one, you know, a death ray or, or something. But what my work is about isn't really the same as, um, oh, the, the kind of weapons they use to, to harass somebody. You know, just to, I know that there's a, an abundance of these gizmos you can shine into somebody's house and they feel like they have ants crawling up their leg or, and, and bug somebody at a personal level. Right, so they're mixing uh, your work with, with yeah. those kinds of Or, or you know, shoot somebody with a ray and have, have a heart attack. But there, there, there are field effects um, and energy weapons that cause field effects and interference within those fields that cause various effects. That wasn't really covered, but maybe they thought that was too difficult for people to understand. Don't know. Now, one question that often gets asked about you, Judy, is um, how come you're still alive if everything that you're saying is mm -hmm. true? Uh, Probably the same reason John Hutchison is <laughs> crazy, insane, you know, get marginalized. That was their approach. If, if they can't um, marginalize you, then they have to take worse measures. And uh, women are usually easier to marginalize. You know, a dumb broad, whatever. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. Women are, the women I've met aren't easy to marginalize. <laughs> <laughs> but I, know, yeah, I think yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. I think I know what you and, mean. And uh, they prefer to go that route, I think. Right. And right. look at how effective it's been. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, now I just want to touch on your academic career. Because uh, you were at uh, Clemson University in South Carolina, and your, you were involved in, in researching 9-11 for a, about a year while you were still there, before you left. Um, how did you find that? W w w well, it's, it's difficult for any um, university, college, or whatever to have this kind of thing going on within it to any large degree. I'm, I'm not implying anything about Clemson. I'm just saying an educational institution anywhere. You know, you have all sorts of trolls on the internet. Trolls, yeah. Yeah, either somebody's leading or they're following or they're in the way. If they're in the way, I call them a troll, just a generic term. And there's the trolls were writing to my department chair, to, to the dean, to my colleagues. I don't think anyone can function anywhere with that. Because y y you would privately share some of your observations of 9-11 with other scientists and they would agree with you, although oh, they, yeah. they wouldn't oh, yeah. come out and but say But they don't themselves. want that to happen to yeah. them. Yeah. And yeah. if somebody has their own uh, engineering firm, they're not going to want to get hung like that. So let's just come on to, because in the last interview that we did, um, you said that some people, or some scientists, had reviewed the work positively. Uh, is there any chance of any of them coming out and uh, being named? Because that's yeah. one thing that's been used against you or that I've heard on the internet. Oh, she's the only one with this. They come out with all sorts of stuff. It, it, recently they've come out that all three of her degrees are from the same institution. Well, they're from different departments within the same institution. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That, I think that's pretty good. But they'll, they'll find whatever they can find. But there are engineers who will stand up for me. One recently, they're starting to get more confidence in that. Uh, one recently was on a radio show with me and Andrew Johnson. Um, he came on as Rob the Engineer, a uh, professional engineer. We also have met several others. There was one with the night before last, the one in Manchester. And then at the Energy Conference, there's another fellow who is going to be helping to host a uh, conference there in Cardiff. Right. All right, Judy, well, we're going to go for another break, and we'll be talking more about the evidence of 9-11 after this. Welcome back. I'm talking to Dr. Judy Wood about 9-11. Now, um, I've also interviewed uh, a chap called Dr. Nick Collestrom all about 7-7, which, um, in my opinion, uh, is another uh, false flag attack. 
this time on London. And Nick said in one of, on a, one of our interviews that, that the, the state, in inverted commas, because it's not the members of parliament doing this, we know that it lies ab above or beyond that, uh, stakes everything. The crew. Yeah, the crew. <laughs> the crew. S the state stakes everything on this. And I said to him, well, what do you mean by that? If it's fully exposed and justice is served, that you mean the state has to fall in order for the truth to come out on it fully? And he, he said, yeah. And, and I thought, wow, you know, that's, we can't just arrest the ones responsible and, and lock them up. Uh, so you, you don't quite agree with that, do you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say 9-11, everything intersects here. The whole world is affected with that. And I, what I have found is that various uh, other events, folks are willing to sacrifice that to save the issue of 9-11. 9-11, everything is on that. And if, if uh, for example, if a third of the people in the world read this book in the next couple of weeks, the crew would be undermined. So what you're saying is that the, the, the technology used um, to do 9-11, that's, that's the ultimate thing, information they're protecting and, and, and they'll sacrifice everything. And not just the technology. 9-11 right. uh, was an attack on human consciousness. It psychologically has controlled everyone. Uh, uh, not everyone, but the, the vast majority. And there's so many issues that that, con that that control is used for that there's so much, like so many things are connected to the 9-11 thing. The 7-7 seven seven is a nice kind of distraction from that. Yeah, it, the, the story isn't as advertised. So the story comes out and they would be willing to sacrifice that for sure, easily, really? to, to protect the 9-11 thing. They could come out and say, well, you know, okay, we got it wrong, you know. As I say, it's like, like uh, the wrong party was given the traffic ticket 10 years ago. That, okay, we got, we got this wrong. And it doesn't really change a whole lot because that's watered in the bridge by now. But do you not think that, let's, let's just say, um, that, that the truth came out about 7-7 and they arrested the, the guy who I want arrested, which is Peter Power, questioned him, found out who organized the territory. Oh, we have one bad guy, you know. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then... One bad apple. And then put them all on trial. Well, put them all on trial, whatever team did it. And, and, and so, so you, would 9-11 would not be the next domino? Oh, you, I, you, no, you, that no. that one is it, totally, you know, several layers right. way, but it's it's involves the whole planet. Right. But there's something I've found very similar between the two. Three plus one equals four. Right. Three planes in buildings, one in the ground, as the story goes. All oh, right, I see. I see and what you're saying. three in the tubes, one in the bus. One, one, right, right. Um, that that one, it can happen anywhere. Right, so they've got three actual physical geographical targets plus one roaming target. Yeah, one, one uh, wild card. Right. So you think that that's done like that for a reason then? Or? Yeah, the, the, uh, the one in Pennsylvania. Yeah. That you're, you're not safe anywhere. Don't go to the cities, don't go to the cities. Don't, don't go in the tubes, but you're not safe anywhere. Right. <laughs> all right. I, think, I think that... That's, that's part of the psychology behind it. Yep. Think. Right, all right. Uh, I don't know if we need to say that or no, not. I've, I've never thought of that before. Okay. Three plus one is four. <laughs> <laughs> Judy's just set a laptop up because she's going to show a little clip of um, Professor Stephen E. Jones. Uh, and this was a sort of a seminal moment of, in the cover-up of uh, the cold fusion technology where he's sitting there with a panel of scientists and they're all voting on whether cold fusion works or not. And you think there's a great deal of peer pressure going on in this conference. This Right. It's uh just explain yeah. it for us, Judy. Yeah, they're they're voting uh well Stephen Jones holds up his hand to get everyone else to to hold up their hand to vote against uh considering any sort of seriousness with the work of Pons and Fleischmann. That their work is dead. Time to move on and just forget about that. Yeah. A and the idea of you know, following along, you know, Stephen Jones holds up his hand and then asks the question, you know, is it, we'll, we'll agree it's dead, and then others hold up their hand, physicists at the table. I don't even think they realize what they're doing. And they hold up their hand, and I've seen him do that with 9-11 with, uh, material, that people tend to just go with the flow. They go with the leader of, of a group. It sounds like something from the Middle Ages. 
But, well, but, but we that all do that to some degree. Yeah. And that, that's something I've been struggling with lately is, you know, part of the human condition. Called like being a sheep. Yeah, yeah. That, that we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every morning. Yeah. We want to be able to build on something, so we make assumptions. And our society has gotten so complex, so complicated, so much time pressure that we don't have time to research things. We, we believe that this person has. That's what the evening news is about. And you think you could, you know, believe somebody and... And, and, and somebody who uh, exerts their influence in order to do that, to cover things up, is known as a gatekeeper. Yes. Uh, and there's a, a chap who's been helping you, his musicians, actually r written a song all about the gatekeepers. Actually, how it began, he read my, he got my book, read it, and was so moved by it that he wrote a song um, called Wake Up, This Is Your Alarm. At where the buildings go and it was it, he summed up in just a few words how that what happened on 9-11 where did the towers go away with the breeze that blows and how much steel did they find could it be shipped in time I don't know I haven't seen the receipt but it doesn't And then following that, he wrote this new song about the gatekeepers. Right. So then you go following them, but you don't know you just need to learn the truth you seek. They want to hide. That's why they keep you close by their side. Um, well, Andrew and I have discussed in a previous show uh, his book, 9-11, uh, Finding the Truth, and we've alluded to, the, to this as well, that, that, that there are key people. And, and others who believe in them, really believe in them, just follow them along, like voting, voting against science. Okay. Um, but the idea that here's free energy technology, let's vote it off the table, and just like that, it's it's gone, and you know, 20 years it took to vindicate Fonz and Fleischmann, but still the rumor is still out there that, that uh, you know, that it's just bogus. So, so you you would argue then that that those, uh, the, what did you call it, the the word you used for them, the the, not the group, the 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 crew, the crew, the crew, yeah, the crew in charge, the, the crew, uh, have taken that research and presumably spent a lot of money developing it to, to get it to the point where it's a weapon. Do you, thi do you think that that group has it for energy generation as well? Oh, there's the black technology must be way ahead of us. And it's like a, a two-tiered culture where we don't know what they have. And it could be they already had that before Pons and Fleischmann. They just didn't want us to have it. 
All right. So, uh, yeah, so, so that's why they were alerted to it so quickly because they right. already knew what it was. Yeah, yeah. and that yep. makes sense. So, and I, I know you don't like to speculate, Judy, but you've it's anti gravity. Um, uh, energy from the vacuum. I got a good one for you. Uh, according to our history books, static electricity was first discovered in the year 600 BC. Um, and then they want us to believe that it took another 2400 years to discover electricity. Does that make sense to you? There are no electrical storms between here and there. I think that things do get discovered, but they get undiscovered and get managed. Right. Yeah, if you go into the, the hidden history and, the, well, the pyramids and other things. I know you've looked at Coral Castle as well and things like that. And I've got a, a comparison in my book that about the stone size and the weight of the Great Pyramid. Uh, each of the stones is about 15 tons, which is just about the same size and shape or in, and weight of the stones that Coral Castle was built with by one guy who weighed about 120 pounds with this little chain and uh, but uh, other technology yeah i've looked at because <laughs> he had a he had he'd had no training in electrical engineering and he built he built what he described as a generator i've seen photographs of it i would love to go and actually see that so i don't know how easy it would be to do that at Coral there's Council. something more important there there is a reason why you don't know i this as the story goes he'd be working in, at night and he'd sense if somebody was watching and would stop right he didn't want anyone to see what he was doing. And a lot of folks say, oh, because it was bogus. No, think about this. He was raised with a respect for this technology. Only those who have earned that respect are allowed to see that technology. And I've come to understand that in terms of the technology used on 9-11. And it's so important for the whole world to know such a technology exists. I think we need a whole generation to be raised with the respect of that technology. And then we can use it for free energy. Right. Because if somebody's going to be monkeying around with it, and oops, so I split the world in half. Didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. So you're, that, you, that's almost providing a justification for them to cover it up, isn't it? Right. Uh, but they've used that? it. They've used it and they displayed it in front of us. And that was a no-no. So how would you, let's say that this technology is given to everyone in the world? Uh, well, if, if everyone looks at what happened on 9-11, they can see it. But they've been hoodwinked into thinking, you know, collapse, uh, pile, terrorists, collapse, pile. And people think th hear those words, and then that's what they think they see. But if they open their eyes and look and observe, they'll see that a technology that was used on 9-11 is, is also capable of providing free energy to the world. But knowing what it can do is comes first. Right. So how, how, I mean, I know it's a philosophical question, which you, there may be no answer to. How is this, is this planet of nearly 7 billion people, if the engineers of that planet are told, given the, given the, the plans and, and the instructions or, or on Or just that, given this book. But what I'm saying, Judy, I, I, is yes, most engineers would go out and build a power station with it and, and, and provide energy for everyone and, and, and clean water, etc. But the, but Not in the but culture we have. No. The culture we have, it's, it's so cutthroat, even uh, in academia, it, your career hangs on how much grant money you get in. And if you can get in grant money with this guy's ideas, often this guy takes that guy's ideas. It's very cutthroat and manipulative and we need to get away from that before we can move forward. And, and how do you see the future, Judy, because um, we've come a long way but really We're not in, there yet. In, in, in terms of the information being accepted it's you're not a long way at all. So how, how, how do you see it? Do you, do you think in 50 years time this will be accepted? I well, think, uh, what's it, the sort of time I think scale? a generation of people growing up understanding this, as soon as everyone understands such technology exists, that's when we can start growing. But if we don't know that, it's going to be used like, I, I was giving the scenario of the different faculty members trying to get grant money. This one's trying to, you know, use this one's ideas to spring forth, or you talk about engineers making power stations. This one wants to outdo that one's power station, so he's going to 
you know, everyone wants to one up the next one, and we'll end up with what we had on 9/11. It, it that's comes from you know power because he who controls the energy controls the people. Right. And if someone is controlling energy, it, they need to realize controlling energy doesn't isn't the way to go because you end up distorting. So some people would 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 then say, well, uh, we need a god to sort it all out for us. <laughs> I know it doesn't bring in, uh, bring in faith or anything, but and, uh, not that I'm, I'm not a religious person, but an, in other words, an arbiter who's not on anyone's side. I think it would, it would solve itself. If every, let's say everyone sees what happened on 9-11. They see the building turning to dust. They see that this technology exists. They know this technology exists. Think what that does. That keeps the technology safer because if somebody's using it then, ooh, everyone points at them. So everyone becomes the policeman. And then pretty soon, everyone has control of the energy for themselves. You know, everyone themselves, if, if we each control the energy, we, nobody controls us. Right, right. All right, Judy, well, uh, thanks again for, Thank you. for doing this interview. And uh, good luck with the rest of the tour. Thanks. You're off to Ab Aberdeen, I think. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, I hope you can understand them. <laughs> I've never, I've never been to Scotland before. All right. Well, um, you're near sure, there, but make, make sure you get, you have some haggis. Okay. What? Haggis. What's that? Oh, don't ask what. Oh, it. okay, okay. <laughs> right. Believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night. Rich Planet TV is coming to a town near you. In May 2013, I will be travelling around the UK, speaking at the following places. Gateshead, Glasgow, Leeds, Liverpool, Birmingham, Western Super, Southampton, Reading and London. I'll be covering recent UFO reports which is not to be missed, and exposing a range of issues you won't find discussed on mainstream TV. Get ticket details from the richplanet.net website.